Oh, press the button already. Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Really. <laughs> 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 oh, that way. <laughs> Hello, Dan. <laughs> Hello, Jack. It's very nice to be here with you once again. Yes, once again. Back at it. Uh, here we are. It's been a while, Dan. It has been a little back. while. We're back. Yeah. Does, um, were the last episodes... Were the last episodes we did, did we record them, like, together, kind of, to put them out? Do no, we did do one since oh, then, didn't okay. we? We recorded two together, and then we recorded the one on the, on the Devil's Chessboard. Yes. Once I came oh, back from yeah, my holiday. A classic. A classic <laughs> app. Classic auxiliary statements joint. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And we've got more classic content today. We certainly do. Yeah. How definitely are you? Do. Yeah, I'm doing well. I'm tired. Work kind of blows. Uh-huh. When so, does it ever? Exactly. <laughs> well, when, when does it ever does not? It not? <laughs> when does it not blow, good fellow? Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's that's about the name of the game yeah, this yeah, time yeah, of the year yeah. for me. Yeah, I was complaining about work this week, and Jack just sent me the gif of Homer Simpson <laughs> pouring water all over the controls that <laughs> yeah. is melting down power station. I like, <laughs> really, I sent that yeah, to you, and that... I was like, "Am I encouraging Dan to like do something rash?" <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. I could. There's, I don't know what harm I could do if I had a full meltdown. I still don't know what harm. <laughs> What was the most harm I could do, really? Yeah, I think the same with me, and I think that's a little disempowering. It's a little yeah, like, wow, yeah, I can ruin yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to be in the position to really fuck shit up if I wanted to, but I don't think either of us are linchpins. Or yeah, anything. I realized, I think I was thinking the other day, like, I'm, I'm doing admin, and I'm, like, at the bottom, right? And I was like, would I want to move up a rung? And I was kind of like, yeah, there's, like, the motivation to, like, you know, ah, moving up, I got a promotion. But I was kind of just like, this isn't really the job that I want. And so like, no, I would not want a promotion. If someone was like, you're doing so well, buddy, we're going to give you more responsibilities. I'd be like, ah, I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want a promotion. I want a raise. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I want a raise in the same level of responsibility. Yeah. I get, or there, maybe the same amount of money for less hours. Yes. Yeah. Now you're thinking. Because there are people that I work with who it's like, you know, they're like at the top. Fewer hours. Fewer hours. Thank you. <laughs> there are people who are at the top and then like I'll get emails from them when I like check in for the day they send an email at like midnight and it's like you guys come on <laughs> you've got to get a life <laughs> yeah i know it's like dear god uh, uh, yeah uh, so yeah that's what i'm doing fair enough fair enough mm. before i came over here i was sitting in the garden and i was finishing up my reading and i was looking at my courgettes uh, i'm a little bit worried about them i think there might have been some mildew on some of the leaves that's the thing we found mildew on the tomatoes yesterday some of those From my understanding is that was when the leaves get wet and then it kind of gets warm yeah, yeah, I've buried little pots next to my squashes uh-huh. to kind of like not get the leaves wet or anything wet when I water them. Just okay. put the water in that and it goes straight to the roots. But then it rains, so it's like... Yeah, it's yeah. water everywhere. Yeah. yeah, it's been particularly damp, hasn't it? Yeah. So I think maybe conditions are ripe for oh! for for some mildew. I was being mm. told that something that they do at vineyards is they plant roses at the ends of the vines, at the end of each vine kind of mm. thing, or row of vines rather, mm. because roses get that kind of thing first. So they're kind of like the, oh, the, the canary, canary and the coal mine yeah. kind of thing. Very cool. Um, we have some a big rose bush right next to our tomatoes. So. <laughs> nice. Perfect. We saw it on the tomatoes and then we saw it on the rose bush. So <laughs> uh, we were failing. To, it's the other way around. They plant wine grapes where they want to plant roses. <laughs> yeah, like we're losing that's our grapes. <laughs> um, so yes, yes. And also last year we had one courgette plant and it... Um, it had a condition which I diagnosed by looking on the internet as blossom rot, which is like uh-huh. the flower at the end of the fruit mm. dies off and it lead, it causes the, some rot to occur in the in the fruit itself. Interesting. Which is apparently caused by, well, if it's not caused by like poor nutrition, it's caused by poor ventilation and irregular watering. Mm. So th- what I was doing was like pruning some of the underlying leaves away to try and get some more airflow around my courgette. So nice. my... Ro- my Nice. My, my my fruit don't rot, and then I found some mildew <laughs> on the leaves. And I'm like, oh yeah, god, <laughs> yeah, it's not going very well. But yeah. hopefully, hopefully, I'll get some courgettes. Yeah, one of the last times we were at the allotment, we uh, were a, a <laughs> wise old uh, allotment feller uh, 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 came by and was like, "The person next to you, like right next to you, has blight on all their potatoes, so like watch yeah. out." And I was yeah. like, "Oh well, that doesn't matter because blight is just like a soil thing." And they're like, "No, it's airborne." And I was like, "Ah, oh, fuck!" And I <laughs> went over there today and I forgot to check for them. So hopefully, I don't have blight still on mm. my potatoes. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. Apparently, p- potato blight starts on the leaves and works its way down. Yes. So you've got to get to purge those leaves. There's your tip. There's yeah. your tip for the day. Yeah. I want to just dig up my potatoes. I'm tired of waiting. I shouldn't have done yeah. main crop. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> You could be eating potatoes right now, Jack. I know. I'm tempted to just try one of the fruits. I hear they're delicious. <laughs> just kidding. Don't, Don't do, do that. that. Don't do that. <laughs> um, no. Yes, what else? Dan, the football did not come home. The football did not. Well, I don't know. Was it? I mean... Still I don't know what we would have done if we had if it had have come home. Would we have known what to do with it? You well, you had some plans for that night. If it did, if it was going to come home, you're going to oh get yeah, lost yeah, in the yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's probably I like. I got a bit into the final, yeah. just a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were in a pub and everybody was getting into it. And I, some of the other games I have struggled to invest myself in. So I decided I'm going to invest myself in this. It was fun. And man. it was good fun watching it. It was. It was good fun watching it. It was a good example of a sort of like the drama in football to some extent. It was yeah. a bit nail biting. I don't yeah. know. I mean, the better team potentially won on the night. Mm. The, 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 the the team that Bastards. performed the best on the night probably won, although it was quite heartbreaking nonetheless. Yeah. Um, uh. But uh, I'm I'm willing to um, echo the sort of general sentiment that I'm being exposed to, which is like England team are a good bunch of lads. Yeah, and, they're a good uh, bunch of and, lads. Uh, we folks. we um, we only wish to celebrate them. Mm. Mm. I'll tell you what. So I, yeah, well, I, what, yeah, but my desire was to like throng into the streets and <laughs> march and chant, and I mean, I don't know what kind of crowd I would have ended up with, and uh, whether I would have enjoyed the experience. I really don't know. <laughs> yeah, from some of the videos coming out of the people hanging out outside Wembley, I don't know. I yeah, been, no, I don't want to be. Little... Don't really want to be with that set, do I? <laughs> um, I might just. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Would have been fun. I shan't. I shan't. Um, I shan't become a football lout. <laughs> I tell you what, though, like. I, on the day of, I found myself getting excited, and I hadn't expected that because I've never really been excited for like a soccer game before. And I was like, "Wow, this is going to be a lot of fun!" And it was a lot of fun, and it was great. Crappy ending. What are you going to do? But like, I think I am tired, Dan, of the kind of like fake anti-nationalist, like we're not going to root for England crowd because it's uh, it's uh, England in it. I think I'm tired of that. I think it was yeah. fun. It was really fun. I had a blast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it like. Um, I guess it's all like culture wars bullshit adjacent <laughs> to some extent. Hundred percent. Um, but there there is truth in the um in the extent to which or the sentiment that uh the British football team represents quite well the diversity of this country. Yeah. And also, uh, it is um, trying to find a word that's not staffed. Um, <laughs> the team is made up. The of. team is made <laughs> up of um, just working class lads. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, really they cool. have lived a social existence that is um, that is representative of one that's experienced by many people growing up in the in the lower echelons of the society that we live in mm. and um some of them choose to represent that mm. yeah and uh it pisses people off <laughs> and all power to them yeah absolutely please go forth and and <laughs> and piss people off i love the people who are like but also, it's, let's not get too bogged down in, like, culture wars bullshit. It but, was fun. Yeah. It was really fun, and it was cool. I, I yeah, I love... Uh, but, but triggering them. Trigger, trigger... Oh, the, trigger tri- away. Trigger, yeah, go trigger, trigger away. Trigger the chuds. <laughs> also trigger the libs, by all means. Trigger away. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, as we've learned from our Thelma Walker interview, that could be one of the most rewarding things you do on Twitter, is triggering libs. Is there um, anything else do you want to uh, no. <laughs> no, nothing at all. Um, except like videos of Shohei Otani hitting dingers. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, I was going to say Marcus Rashford, cool fella. And I love that everybody's like, oh, he's getting all political in it. And he's just like, can kids have food? Yeah, <laughs> it's not even like. It's like, please. Exactly, yeah. It's like, can, we, can we, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> He's basically do it. He's basically taking on the social responsibility of asking, "Please, sir, can we have some more?" <laughs> yeah, literally, <laughs> exactly. It's not really something that. I mean, obviously, it should be celebrated, but like, yeah, 
Controversial, um, perhaps not. It's yeah, 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 yeah shouldn't yeah. be. I should yeah, say. and it's representative of a dire circumstance. <laughs> yeah. um, and I guess we should not be. I mean, the ultimate sadness of it is we should not necessarily be turning to these people to. We yeah. should not necessarily. We should not require these people to be our champions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Valuable or grateful as we are for their work. Yeah, hundred percent. I keep thinking about how um, sports are going to function under. Uh, for the listener, as you can't tell by the title, we're reading the third part, the third and final part of uh, Fundamental Principles, Communist Production Distribution, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> we say third and final part, like, based on our arbitrary breaking up of the yes, book into yeah, three sections. There are no parts. Yeah. <laughs> um, in, this, in that promised society, how sports would function, and I think it would, first of all, I feel like you'd have to have some sort of unit of account if you actually wanted to have some kind of capitalist-esque structure to your sports teams, which I'll get to in a moment why you might not need that. But if you wanted to like actively trade players and stuff, you would need to have something like money, I think, that's like, this player is worth 50 ducats. This player is worth 500 million ducats or whatever. But I think it would just become a lot more of a regional, cool, fun, awesome thing because it's like, oh, the team from Canterbury now is playing the team from whatever. Yeah, could you just have a monetary system Only totally unique to the sport, right? It's just monopoly <laughs> yeah. money, right? Yeah. Like, here's your budget. I mean, it's just a, it's like it's a different way of doing a player cap, like a price cap, presumably. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it's also like because there are no owners, it's like that stuff is meaningless. Sure. You're just arbitrarily kind of who decides what this player's worth, which is kind of why I think sports would be completely different. <laughs> it would be more regional and like not, mm. you know, fake. The general council will decide. <laughs> yes, the general council will decide all. <laughs> um, the general council, the football council. Exactly. Anyway, um, last thing I'll say on sports, uh, mm. show how Tony rocks. All-star okay. game, home run derby this weekend. He didn't do too much in either, other than doing really well in the home run derby, not winning it, and then starting pitching for the American League, and then hitting leadoff. Hmm. Didn't, actually, I don't think get a hit, didn't get any strikeouts. Still, nothing bad happened, and I think that rocks. Um, mm-hmm. Baseball. Yeah. It's going well. There, there's something we haven't addressed yet. <laughs> I don't know whether it's something of Uh-oh. an elephant in the room. Uh-oh. <laughs> Um, it's been a question that I think has been put on both of our minds, perhaps. All right. Um, and I feel like we have to put out a disclaimer that we had no hand in the death of Dom and Rumsfeld. Oh my God! <laughs> I forgot about that. Holy shit, you're right. Oh my God. For, for the listeners, Dan and I were recording the last episode that we did, and had I looked at my phone while we were recording, I would have seen that while we were recording, Donald Rumsfeld died. Nothing to do with us. Jack was very irate, or, or like frustrated <laughs> yeah. at the fact that we hadn't he hadn't looked at his phone. We almost turned yeah. on the microphones again to like. <laughs> yeah, I know, but no. Post a, a addendum. Statements. I mean, there isn't a lot to say, but like, other than that, the bad energy that we put into the world worked. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> for yeah, once. Yeah. 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 So yeah. rest. But it's only, it was only it was it was yeah it was only it was only um, <laughs> it was only if, if we contributed to. The outcome, it was only a contribution of vibes. Yes, And exactly. nothing more. NSA, it was only the vibes. <laughs> <laughs> it was nothing else, we promise. How did he die? Was he just old? I have no idea. He was just yeah. old. He was just old. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the evil rotted him from the inside out. You know what I want? But the problem though. is, like, evil, evil seems to... Um, <laughs> be far more fortifying than it is debilitating it is. when it comes to longevity. Dick Cheney. Yeah. Any of the bushes. Yeah, whatever. Um, uh, other than Scalia, I don't know how old he was. He just seemed to die of being fat. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> sometimes that'll get you. Sometimes yeah. it will also be yeah, being yeah, yeah. fat. And and sometimes, like, I'm trying to think of, have you, did you, have you watched the movie Vice? No, I oh, haven't. But, uh, oh, I don't know whether to spoil it. Well, I mean, if it's just history, I mean, I don't know to spoil it for the people. Well, I mean, it, the, the well, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a facet of the construction of the movie. You know what? Let's is, let's save it because we, I think it would be fun to watch it. We could watch it and talk about it. Yeah, yeah. all right, all right, all right. Yeah, <laughs> we'll watch that in double. There's, yeah, there's the, the, the central to that movie is um, Dick Cheney's a a, a, a a flirtation with death that he has, should we say? Ah, uh, interesting. Yeah. I know there's a scene where you see his heart. Which oh, right. Okay. Well, yeah, it's sort of. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. 
We'll come back to it. Let's put a pin in that yeah, one. Put a pin in Dick Cheney. Yeah. Although, yeah. <laughs> it might work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Allegedly. Yeah. Uh, Jack, yeah, Jack's got like a Dick Cheney doll upstairs. <laughs> Yeah, it's a voodoo doll. It's a voodoo doll. Oh, right. Okay, it's a voodoo doll. That's what I'm implying. I know. <laughs> See, okay. It's not a Dick Cheney body pillow. No. I have several of those. Uh-huh. Um, okay. <laughs> Dan, uh-huh. I'm, I'm putting the book forward on, on the table. Uh-huh. Um, Unopened, but we're just going to yeah. like, we just sort of shuffle the books and the notes around a little bit and then don't refer to them at all. Yeah, exactly. That's usually what I do. Anyway. To look smart, but we re- then we realize nobody's actually watching us. Yeah. Um, Dan, you tell us about what we read. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did only what just did finish read? reading it. What did we read? Chapters. Uh, chapters. <laughs> um yeah, I mean, I think a, a, I think a um, very observant listener might realize that we skipped a chapter here, uh, but it didn't really matter. Did we? Did we not read 11? Uh, well, we sort of read it last week, and we sort of read it this week, and we didn't do either. Oh, we didn't, never talked about it, but I don't know what the content is, so let's not do it. Okay. We read from chapter 12 onwards, we started with the <laughs> abolition of the market. Yes. Uh, from the fundamental principles of communist production and distribution, co-authored or collectively authored <laughs> by the group of international communists. Um, I've never done this before, but uh, obviously this is the a third discussion we've had about this book. Mm. Go back and listen to the others and then come back to this one. But also, whenever I, ever, whenever I hear other podcasters say that on podcasts that I'm listening to, I'm like... Fuck you! I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so, so or just stay. I don't. It I'm going to say don't go back and listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this out. one, um, this third section, as we keep referring to it, arbitrarily determined by our capacity to read or not read, um, didn't introduce a huge amount in terms of new theoretical content or new. Uh, formulas, mm. or I suppose the yeah, th- <laughs> yeah, yeah, new, new, particularly new content. A lot of it was, um, sort of stuff that we're already familiar with from the other sections, applied in different ways, kind of thing, or a narrative we, we've already been given, uh, applied to specific context, content, mm. context, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Um, but also, yeah, some interesting stuff in there. Yeah. Which we will get onto. Yeah, no, absolutely. I still firm, hold firmly to the belief that this book rocks. Um, and what was the... We read something else, and I remember being disappointed with the last sentence, but I forget what it was. Um, it was, must have been one of the only other books we've read, but I forget what it was. Hmm. Um, maybe it was The Alan Mason Squid, but maybe not. I don't know. This one is kind of the same thing, but it was also just because it, this book is a, like... I'm not going to say disjointed, but like... The final considerations, which is the last chapter, chapter 17, was a little bit of like, oh, and here are a bunch of other things that we kind of haven't really got yeah. to. But, yeah, 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 yeah. There are, there's a degree to which it feels like a work in progress for the authors. Mm. It also feels like they're presenting it as a work in progress for the working class movement in general. Mm. Like, we're going to have to get more history and more examples of things before we can fully work these things out. Mm. Um but they also quite frequently describe it as like a pamphlet or an essay. Um, and it has the qualities of that sort kind of thing, like sort of unfinished, sort of a, a gesture or an offer. Yeah. Um, but also, like we, as we've discussed before, like its whole uh, shtick, I suppose, its <laughs> premise is that it's offering us some fundamental principles. It's not giving you yeah. the system. Yeah. It's not giving you like there. There is a distinction in this book, and it becomes quite significant in this final section between, um, like the the basic principles of the functioning of the system, which are to some extent economic, and then the stuff which is, um, the political edifice that that is built that's built upon that. I suppose like the the. It's presenting us some economic fundamentals for how communism would work. Mm. It's telling us what things would be necessary for you to have communism. Mm. But it's not saying, as we were, jo- we were joking before, the joke that I made before about the the general council or what have you. Like, there's an extent <laughs> to which, like, there are lots of question marks in this book, and because they're um, council communists, like mm. most of the <laughs> Most of what you're supposed to fill in is just the council, the council. will do this, yeah, the, the council, council will, will decide it. that, the councils will do this and decide that, and like so. Whenever there's a question mark about like the political the political edifice 
of the communist system. Mm. Um, it's kind of left open. Yeah, um, I mean, intentionally and deliberately. Yeah, the, and not not to its. I don't think it's to its detriment, really. No, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, this has been sped, said by smarter people than me, but um, none of this stuff really would work unless you have an organized system. A system that's able to organize itself, which is to basically say like a theory behind organization, which is kind of like, I suppose, why we're really interested in the cybernetic stuff and like mm -hmm. how a viable mm -hmm. system is able to not only like organize itself, but maintain itself in the long run, hence being viable. And it's funny because like at the beginning, they posed that question of like federalism versus centralization or centralism, whatever. Um, and they come back to it at the end as kind of like a roundabout way of saying like, now that we've said that the most important feature of transitioning to communism and just communism itself is the general like economic laws of movement um that question becomes unnecessary and it's funny because at the beginning right they say federalism versus centralism um is like it's neither but then they come back to it at the end by saying like well it's also it's, uh, it's kind of both <laughs> <laughs> and yeah I, yeah to just say again that definitely reminded me quite a bit of like the cursor reading we've done of stafford beer and stuff um but Again, as you say, the main point of this book is to introduce the laws that you would absolutely need to have for communism to be a thing, um, and those are pretty simple. And I don't know, do we do we want to run through again? Do we need to retouch on like how the system is organized briefly, just like labor time or stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I guess um, we can cover it in terms of a dis through, I guess, a discussion of the first chapter of the ones mm. that we read today, which is the. The question of market abolition, I suppose, and they they start that section by uh, criticizing again the way that the Soviet Union went about an effort to implement communism, mm. and their critique, as we've heard before, is that like uh, the Soviet Union, and it's not just a symptom of the sort of um, of communist theory as represented by the. Um, uh, thinkers the theoretical thinkers of the russian communist party but mm. the russian communist party uh, and its intellectual heavyweights were working in the tradition of um uh european social democracy i suppose and they were very much in line with the mainstream economic understanding as represented by um most of the or all of the socialist and communist movement at the time um but for one they the main grounds upon which they're criticized is that they want to implement communism without a unit of account. And we've covered this before. Yeah. Um, they want to tra they want all trade but all can't say trade because it's <laughs> uh, it's too mired in the uh, 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 understanding that's predicated on capitalist principles but like uh, all the movement of goods within the society will be done entirely predicated on exchanging kind and there will be no process of accounting there will be no knowing uh whether people are um there's no just basically just no uh, tracking of the process of the the exchange and there's no remuneration directly an equivalent remuneration if that makes sense um so yeah there's that criticism and then also there's the criticism that we'll come on to this a little bit later on in some of the other chapters there's a criticism of the soviet union in terms of uh, their vision of communism being one um, which is also represented by um, sort of like Kautsky's understanding or uh, Hilferding's understanding, which is that communism is built from capitalism's tendency to centralise control. And so we're going to build communism off the back of the uh, centralizing tendency of capitalism to build a greater and greater um, uh, or sort of a, a, a bigger and bigger or to accumulate uh, productive units within one controlling apparatus, which is in capitalism like the growth of uh, larger and larger, but a smaller and smaller number of firms have a larger and larger control of the economy. And the idea is that, like, the state would take over and just become one general cartel that controlled all of production kind of thing. Um, and their, their general critique of the Soviet Union is basically that, that um, that doesn't... Uh, 
that that isn't the best way to go about overcome overcoming capitalism and introducing communism kind of thing mm. um but in terms of um in terms of market abolition like the most important thing is uh having to maintain a unit of accounting i suppose mm. um yeah it's also like just this general idea of like the soviet union did try to like you know, they don't knock the idea that it's impossible to just centrally decide what everybody needs and uh -huh. give it to them because they're like, yeah, okay, you could probably decide how much bread someone needs. They make the point that that's not exactly flourishing and that's mm. not exactly democratic really at all. And it creates this bureaucratic caste on top of everybody. But they also make a point where it's like, the more you do that, the more you're centralizing things. And the more you centralize things, the more you're basically just like taking workers' control completely out of the equation. And I mean, like... They kind of make the point that this was never really going to work out for a number of reasons. Um, one of which was basically they say, and we'll get onto this when we talk about the dictatorship of the proletariat. Um, but like they say that the dictatorship of the class, meaning like the Bolshevik party dictatorship, um, w was a way to basically, maybe not purposefully to do this, but it doesn't matter, but that was a way to stop the actual workers' control of the dictatorship of the proletariat. Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, I don't know, in terms of consumption, like, they basically just make the point that <laughs> from the start, centralizing things and trying to accord everything to, like, uh, you know, statistics and input and output tables is not creating a viable system. For one thing, it's not giving, actually giving the workers control of things. So they basically say, as, you know, as you continue to do this, you're continuing to move away from communism, not towards communism, which is what they thought they were doing. But also just like uh, you're creating a system which is not self-reliant and cannot organize itself by itself. You're one that just relies on the state. So it's like, okay, the state's not exactly going to wither away here under the system. Um, yeah. And I mean, I guess you just have to look to like the actual material circumstances of why this why this happened, and like they were fighting a series of wars <laughs> that were like some of the worst in history. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't want to like blame Lenin or anybody like that or come across like a dick, but if I had to blame anybody, I blame Trotsky. <laughs> 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 there are some quotes in here where Trotsky does not come across yeah very well. I mean, there is also a quote where Lenin is like. <laughs> Yeah, state capitalism is what we're is our aspiration. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, by which I think he means that like we're looking to how capitalism is functioning, how capitalism is um, mm. causing a greater and greater accumulation of productive capacity under the umbrella of one uh, dictatorial or central. Mm corporation and we're just going to transition that corporation into being the state and then the state will be able to direct production um but yeah you're incredible you're entirely right to say that um one of their primary focuses is or or one of the things that they aim to emphasize and one of the things that the central thing that we are um compelled to learn from this book is that um nationalization isn't socialism <laughs> yeah and it comes back to this term that we've had from the beginning of the book that um the workers the proletariat have to have disposal over the products of production as well yeah. as they can't just own the means of production mm. they also have to have the right to determine what happens to the things that are produced mm. and if the things that are produced are just expropriated by the state mm. and if they are um paid a wage then you maintain a market in labor yeah. which is well, coming back to this idea of the abolition of the market like if you if you pay people um if if the state is buying labor power from the workers then you're maintaining a market in labor kind of thing which is something that they want to to do away with but also they just want to um you cannot have one of the things they come back to again in this section is the idea that socialism or communism is the society of free and equal producers. And you cannot have the society of free and equal producers if uh, what dictates production is um, state diktat, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny. Like, you want to give them the benefit of the doubt for a number of reasons, right? Uh -huh. Like, for a million reasons. But it's also like they bring up the point where they were like... Uh, 
some train related council, I believe, I forget exactly what it was, was like abolished and they put a director in charge, a manager in charge in like December of 1917. So it's like, yeah, you're right. They weren't exactly trying to give all power to the council. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there, there is a point in this where they're talking about like um, how, the Sov- how the Bolsheviks in particular incorporated the council system, the Soviet system, mm. the system of uh, workers' representation in workers' councils uh, that came about relatively spontaneously in both the 1905 and the 1917 revolutions. Mm. And they suggest that basically it was just politically expedient for the Bolsheviks to attach their name to this. But I don't know whether it was a intentional deception or as you suggest, like if we're going to be politically charitable, like on the the desperate and dire circumstances of political and economic reality that the Soviet Union found themselves in, that they they required to jettison all of that rhetorical commitment to... uh, workers control yeah um yeah and yeah and i mean it it was it's definitely worth pausing on like obviously this is the group of international uh communists definitely councilists obviously so no real kind words for trade unions here but to make the point you know where it's like the trade unions will they can kind of just function as a bureaucracy in and of themselves and like the difference between that and a council is just that like the councils are actually the workers themselves at their job organizing how their job is going to run and if you're in a factory how your factory is going to run if you're at like a coffee house or whatever right now the coffee house is going to run um but it's interesting i mean i know like (laughs) i would like someone to point to like any councils that exist now you know what i mean and it's like when we read the problems of the german revolution I think that Reinhard Rurup bit, they, he talked a lot about just like the councils just happened because this was like they needed to happen. And it's like whenever you hear people talk about like, you know, the spontaneity of the workers, it's like, yeah, in times of crisis, it's not like this is just like the goddamn gumption of the, the, the blessed working class. It's like councils form because they need to form. You know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know, the thought of like councils forming in anything other than like a crisis scenario is something that I was kind of thinking about when I was reading this because like now, first of all, imagine someone trying to form a council at Amazon that would be like shot. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that would just never happen. Mm-hmm. But also just like, yeah, I don't know. I guess just in, in generally it got me thinking about how this could be implemented without a crisis. Maybe. I don't know. Um, sure. Yeah. I don't know whether a transformation in social relations can only come about when there is some amount of crisis. Mm. And I suppose whether the possibility for that transformation in social relations and the attendant crisis can be brought about through political agitation is an open question, isn't it? Or whether it necessitates like some kind of external or endogenous economic or otherwise social collapse kind of thing, whether it's only feasible in the circumstances of war or uh, some other kind of disaster. One would like to hope that, well, even if it, even, I guess it's a political game, right? Like if one were intending to implement a political strategy to build up political pa- the political power of the working class to operate autonomously, um, you'd st- it would still be a political, an attendant political question mm. looking for the social circumstances when that power can be best wielded to yeah. attain the outcome. Yeah. I feel like I was thinking about I think about like councils as something like attendant to the social circumstances whereby a transformation in social relations is feasible, made feasible yeah. by history kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so they have no relevant existence now because how would they fit into yeah. capitalist social relations? They don't, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's interesting, too, like, just having a discussion about the party as well, because they're, like, not not uh, big on uh, dominations of a uh, party, even, like, a class-based party. But then, like, it's also, like, exactly what you're saying. It's like, well, there isn't anything, like, ignoble in starting a working-class political party to, like, even if it's just to bring consciousness to the working class, class consciousness, like... But then you kind of get into the question of like, well, if that's just the case, what is the actual end goal? And it's like, well, if you actually were to take control of the state, like how would that work? I don't know. It, it, that was one thing that I kind of asterisked in this book was all of their suspicions of political parties because it's like, okay, then are you just – then are you really just waiting for crisis? Like if you're not actually going to take power into your own hands and do something about it, um, 
you know, because like the only way for this to work perfectly would be like a worldwide instantaneous revolution where everybody just switches to working time calculation, I feel like, because like otherwise, let's just say they only did it in America, which is like a pretty big if, and somehow the control of the state was in the hands of the working class. It's like you would need a pretty big budget for defense, you know, so I don't know like how that would fit into all of this and like, I don't know. I suppose I'm just having a kind of problem squaring the circle of like, or circling the square, squaring the circle of uh, the allergic reaction, as I think you said in one of our last episodes, to a political party, but then also like, well, what are you going to do? You know, what else are you going to do? How are you going to make it happen? And I mean, that's not answered in this book, but they can also always just fall back on that. Well, this is just the principles of production and mm. distribution. So They do a few times allude to the question of political power mm. or social power or power in general. And I guess their answer would be that this thing would um, objective political power, the power of the working class to enforce or implement a fundamental change in social relations or um, the mode of to fundamentally change the mode of production, I suppose. I guess their answer would be that um, it would come about from the spontaneous or otherwise change in the consciousness of the working class if they were council communists right like mm. it's going to emerge from um almost spontaneously i suppose mm. um but you can also answer that question with well we need to politically work toward the point whereby the working class is in a position to enforce this change because yeah. yeah. there are some moments in this where they talk about um the situation in the Soviet Union just immediately after the revolution and just imply that uh, working class power was just not sufficient to yeah. implement this system. Almost implies that it was kind of impossible kind of thing. Um, yeah. And there are some po some points when they're talking in terms of the German revolution and they imply something very similar. Yeah. That always, that always not to interrupt, but it always almost feels like hindsight bias there. Yeah. You know what I mean? I yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Because it's yeah. like, would you be saying that at the time? And also, like, uh, is, are we really going to be that determinist about it? Like, did you make the point in the book where it was like, yeah, and there were also a, a big part of the working class was just bought over to the Bolshevik side by these promises of, like, state socialism and stuff. So, I don't know. I always, yeah. I always get a little weary of arguments like that that aren't don't seem like they're based in historical materialism other than just, like, a... Yeah, it was never going to happen. It's like yeah, a yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> there is know. a certain abstracting you can do from history where you can yeah. look for ideal circumstances. And yeah, there's something that's also been playing on my mind, which is a bit of an aside. Mm. Um, I was listening to an interview that Doug Lane did with Zero Books, interviewing Chris, Chris Catrone from the Platypus Affiliated Society. <laughs> affiliated society. And Chris Catrone was basically just saying that like, all of these characters, whoever they are, like these critics, the, the council communists, or I mean, he named some proper names kind of thing. I think he was talking about Paul Mattock to some extent. Mm. Oh, I think the phrase he used was like, they're minnows in comparison to the like, the Lenins and the Luxembourgs sure. and like yeah. people who actually became, but I mean, they, 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 they had a political force behind them kind of thing. They're not like great figures in and of themselves, but like they were in a position to take a role on a sort of like world historic stage kind of thing. Yeah. So hmm. we should always be in a position to critique these people. But I think I mean, you've always already applied some of this kind of like a degree of generosity, generosity mm. perhaps ought to be given as well. The book is implying that there was a sort of like theoretical, fundamental theoretical rot that undermined mm. that entire sort of like first 20 years of the 20th century's uh, socialist theory um and that's all good and well and we should think about it in those kind of terms but also i think perhaps there is a space for a generosity toward these people who were genuine historical figures who mm. um will go down in history as such i suppose as like yeah i don't know maybe something for us to speculate on into the future I don't know. yeah true yeah yeah i mean it's funny right because it's like you re you really have to question people like lenin and trotsky when it's like it, it, I don't know, like, just it, the idea of, like, getting into power, which, first of all, Lenin, amazing politician, amazing mm -hmm. revolution, revolutionary, obviously, but it's like, to get into power and to just be like, we're going to do everything state socialism-wise, 
but I also don't know anything about planning. And then, to, like, on top of that, to not even consider what Marx talked about, again, obviously, there are, like, different historical, like, circumstances, material circumstances that make it more difficult to just be like, labor time, we're going to do what he said in the Gotha program. But it's like, I don't know, I, I it's like, you guys, come on. Because I feel like I've always heard from people that it's like, well, you know, Marx writing about capitalism is all well and good, but he never really did come up with how, uh, what a communist society would look like. It's like, that isn't true. <laughs> That's not true at all. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, you just have to read the, like, five pages or whatever in the Critique of the Gotha program to get the seeds of, like, the new laws of economic movement. Yeah. Again, which this book flushes out to be, like, what is going to decide everything Yeah, else. this book is a direct extrapolation from mm. the tidbits that you get from Marx, right? Like, yeah. It's like one step removed. It's the next rung on the ladder yeah. of elaborating. <laughs> Going down the iceberg. The, the thing that which Marx is accused of never offering, which is an explanation or a description of what communism is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Disappointing, fellas. Disappointing. Um, <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, what next? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, <laughs> um, I think, I mean, it, it's, uh, uh, I, I guess something more that I, I guess is worth saying on in terms of um, the question of market abolition, right? Is this stuff that they talk about in terms of like um, social relations being determinative of the the form in which uh, these social phenomena take? If that makes any sense. Sure. So one of the things they say is that like um, markets or capitalist markets are an expression of social relations, and they've already talked about this in earlier sections of the book, and we've talked about it in previous episodes. Of when we've discussed this, um, one of the th one of their fundamental things that they want to abolish is all all ownership, mm. ownership of any um, any kind of private um, any private ownership of means of production or uh, inputs to productive processes. I suppose um, the way they describe the movement of goods between productive units is one of like. Um, transition based on a recording of how many labor hours have been added but there's not a direct yeah. payment that goes on kind of thing nobody's like paying for and therefore taking ownership of things like all means of production and all inputs to production are the collective ownership are collectively owned by society and they're just administered by the productive units that are currently working on them kind of thing um so the implication is that like, by virtue of the fact that you abolish private ownership of means of production, you um, almost abolish the market or the, you abolish the way the market functions in terms of um, coordinating uh, certain aspects of production. But one of the th in contrast to the Soviet Union's desire to not have a unit of account at all, one of the things that they say is that, in actual fact, um, the market under capitalism fulfills a function of um, distributing goods to consumers and also uh, facilitating the movement of goods around from one productive unit to the next kind of thing. And those are mechanisms that are going to have to be achieved under communism kind of thing they sure. are they're not unique to how capitalist production functions kind of thing um so obviously we've already covered it like what they're offering forward is labor time calculations as a replacement for money accounting to govern this movement of goods and this um to facilitate the consumption by consumers kind of thing mm. um and in another one of these way, another one of these like moments in the book that we've come across before, where they're kind of like this is what, what you call like bizarro capitalism or something, <laughs> like it's kind of like it's kind of capitalism is it kind yeah. of not kind of thing? They're like there are functions in this. There are, there are some of the functions of this system as they're describing it would resemble capitalist markets in some ways if one weren't looking too closely, kind of thing. Like. Yeah. Form is kind of similar, but the content is fundamentally changed by mm. virtue of the fact that the social relations are changed, kind mm. of thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's still bookkeeping. There's still remuneration. They're still going to work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're yeah. still yeah. being paid, There's still, like, unquote. transfer. Yeah, there's still there's, consumption. But rather, there isn't exchange. There's still transfer. There isn't, yeah. like, ownership. There's just... 
the right to consume kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But like some of these words, there's this sort of slippage of terminology. You could mm. use the existing words if you wanted to. Yeah, easily. But you'd be describing a different function by virtue of the fact that you've changed the social relations kind of thing. So um, what's quite fun about this book is that like um, allowing for the fundament- a fundamental change in the social relations, but um, the way the economic edifice functions mm. is fundamentally changed by that change, but not like uh, it still resembles capitalism kind of thing mm. to the extent of like, Coming to back to this phrase for Marx, that like the 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 one society is born from the womb of the other kind of thing. Like mm. it's uh, you are not going to create sort of like from nothing the new society. It's always going to be like marked with exactly. what has come before. Yeah. Um, by virtue of the fact that like our <laughs> human are. brains are the same, and we're gonna like, <laughs> yeah. like that that thing for Marx about like it's gonna take you a long time just to change yourselves, kind of thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and by virtue of just the concentrated production apparatus as well, and just like the fact that we have these factories and a division of labor, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it, yes, it's speaking of like one society being born from the other, it, the thing that I'm, I'm really, really interested in this whole book is like the idea of the transition. Um, again, in the last in the last part of the book, you touched on this. They they have like this series of equations that I'll be honest skipped. Mm -hmm. (laughs) because they talk all about um how you go from money to these like labor certificates kind of things to labor time planning and they put forward some like well you know times 0.4 plus one carry the two kind of thing but they're basically just making the point that like look they did it after world war one when nobody had any money to do anything they just changed to different currencies and they're like would be a relatively similar thing here in a transition phase. But I'm really interested in like the the like growing and shrinking of different industries because again, another asterisk that I had in this book was like perhaps a bit flippant about how that would happen because obviously a, co- a communist society is going to be based on uh, use values and on actual like needs of the working class, which is not what we have now. Um, so that's going to be twofold, and like there are a lot of our needs that aren't being met. So you're going to have to grow quite a bit of industry, but then there are also like things that are just so harmful and so detrimental that you're just going to want to get rid of. And then there are things where it's like this is useless, nobody cares. Let's just get rid of this industry. Um, and yeah, maybe maybe they were flippant about it, about just saying like, uh, uh, what's the word they use? They said this this will happen that like the systematic shrinking of a society, and it's like. If you're really against this kind of, like, centralized approach of, like, the state kind of, like, deciding these things for you and, like, making it happen and somebody making it happen. uh, The council. (laughs) Exactly. The council will do it. Um, That's going to be tricky, obviously, because, like, we were talking about this beforehand and you, you, you brought up a lot of really good points I hadn't thought about, but it's, like perhaps the biggest industry on the planet, I'm, I don't know, I'm just guessing here, is like the war economy because that funds into so much stuff that just isn't really related to war, but is like, hey, we'll just pay for some DARPA stuff for your college or whatever. Um, like, how do you deal with the people that you're potentially putting out of work? Um, but then also, like, you brought up the point where it's like just giving people the power to, like, rejig their facilities um, to actually uh, correspond to use value and to need um, might not be as complicated as we think, but at the same time, I feel like this would all happen quite quickly as soon, like if you were to have this sudden break in the profit system in production for profit, you would suddenly have a lot of industry that you don't need at all. And making that transition to like how you have that useless industry be either transformed or shut down completely, like transformed into something useful, that's I think harder than this book makes out. Um, although I really don't have anything to base that on other than just like, uh, it just seems like it would be extremely difficult and just brushing it away and saying like, it'll be systematic is like, okay, well, that's going to be quite a bit of work because again, like as soon as you implement this system, which let's just say you could implement overnight, like you're going to have problems on your hand because there's going to be a lot of industry that doesn't fit with this new mode of production. Uh, and if everybody has to work to eat as would still need to be the case, unless you can't under communism, um, how, do, how do you balance that? I don't know, it's interesting. It led to a lot of like questions about what you can do with these industries, these really crappy industries. 
um, you brought up the uh, idea of like what to do with advertising. Maybe advertising could be used for communication, for I don't know, lots of different things. Um, yeah, I don't know. I was just really fascinated with that whole section. I think. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of weight is is left on that um, term. Was it systematic? Yeah, the systematic shrinking. Yeah, of yeah as opposed to chaotic. It won't be chaotic. <laughs> it'll be systematic. <laughs> take, give, take our word for it, kind of thing. Um, yeah, I was trying to think about it in terms of um, well, one the new system being one in which you're aiming to meet needs in a way that the capitalist market doesn't meet needs, right? Mm. So you're setting people the task of meeting needs. They also talk a lot of a lot of the time about producers being also consumers. So there's not this distinction between a realm of production and a realm of consumption, which kind of happens under capitalism, right? Mm. Because like people produce, um, f- predicting what the whims of consumers would be, but the, the the information is delayed, kind of thing. It's only when the thing goes to the market that you try and work out actually whether you've met a need or not, kind of thing. I think there's an extent to which this system is proposing to like unite those two worlds of like production and consumption. Yeah. Um, I was also thinking about it in terms of like uh, workers being custodians of a certain amount of productive capacity. We're just taking over a capitalist economy that has certain productive capacities. And then the question then becomes a question for the workers of like, how are you going to adapt the, mm. uh, the means of production you now have custodianship of mm. to... Uh, gel vibe. <laughs> uh, it's all about the vibes. Find their place within this new, these new social relations kind of thing. Like, mm. um, and I was wonder whether that's like a task which you would set workers. Mm. But it's difficult, right? Because you're quite right to say that like there are certain industries that like are so uh, redundant in the com- under communism or so from an ethical standpoint, so more abundant the capitalism yeah. that you're just like, quite how would that process go? Um, mm. But we were talking, we can come, I guess we can come on to this a little bit. We were, when we were talking before we started recording, we were talking about this in terms of some of the things that come up in the later chapters of this book, in terms of the systematic process whereby you would expand production. Yeah, ideally yeah, yeah. the the process is that you expand production to meet to 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 greater fit with demand um demanding needs which are not being met at the moment but you want to have your productive the productive capacities of your economy meet the uh consumer demand of your economy kind of thing mm. um and we were talking about well the book describes various ways in which you would set aside a fund for this process whether it's a generic growth fund or whether it's various ways in which um, uh, labor hours, I suppose, would be given to certain industries to fundamentally change or to greatly expand their productive capacities. Um, And I guess that greater production capacity might be met by contraction in other productive uh, productive areas kind of thing. but if it is the question of like producers being asked to budget or to um, to put forward a proposal for how the productive unit that they are now custodians of could be much better utilized or used, mm. um, you might see, as you were saying, like processes whereby workers in an industry decide how their uh, their product, the productive unit that they work in could be much better uh, utilized to meet need by virtue of the fact that they are also consumers as well as producers. They live in society. They understand their productive skill or they understand the thing that they're educated in. They mm. have a much better understanding of how... We're talking about something like aerospace or like uh, um, the arms trade, I suppose, is mm. is a is a quite a useful example in terms of like it utilizes a lot of um really uh important expertise and it also is a highly technical both in terms of the skills but also in terms of like the machines and the industry that backs it up. 
Mm. But obviously it it uh, results in an incredibly inhuman social end kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but th- it's quite an, it's quite a, it's quite an, it's quite a soft or an easy example of an industry how you could think about transforming it, right? Because it does, as I say, have all that technical knowledge and know-how and machinery behind it. Mm. Um, and also, you have a particularly skilled workforce who is very well educated. And if it was put in the position of no longer having to meet the uh, profit-driven ends of capitalism, but in ter- but instead was asked to. Uh, facilitate the growth in the meeting of needs that was the ultimate aim of communism what would those workers actually decide they wanted to do yeah um i mean the the possibilities might be myriad and endless and we we're not in a position to think it, think about them in the way that those people though the people who work in that industry might be the ideal ones that are in the position to yeah to transform that. it you know the, yeah imagine that the people <laughs> who work in some in an industry are the people in the be- best position to transform it for the better if you put in place social um uh, relationships or mm. a new new social relations which allowed for that to happen kind of thing yeah i mean there are probably people the listener could probably think of examples of industries that don't uh fulfill those same criteria in terms of the raw material that they're working with but um yeah i wonder i, don't know. I, don't I know. mean if you can do it with war you know yeah, what I mean? quite. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like i don't know yeah, yeah 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 it is yeah it's interesting too just because like um the the general this kind of gets into the general idea of like how this system puts in place incentive structures without actively like kind of thinking about those incentive structures because it's like say you're in an industry like oh you mean I, capitalism or all this what's proposed communism, oh, communism. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah because it's like say you're in an industry like uh you work for northrop grumman and your job is to design the you know landing gears for the drone that exclusively kills people in yemen or whatever like you and suddenly, right, you were to get into, like, some kind of, you know, like, communist society and you'd have to be like, oh, my God, like, what can I do? It's not like you would just be like, well, whatever, I'm just going to ignore all of my expertise and just fob off and just live off the dole, baby. Like, you're still incentivized. Oh, you're on a bum. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're still incentivized to work because you have to work. And, like, the incentive structure of, like, you, say you wanted to continue to work at the company formerly known as Northrop Grumman, like, you would still... You would have to figure out uh, how to adapt your industry to meet these new uh, criteria and these new standards of, the, of a communist society because, like, the system does look after itself. It is, as described in this book, like a viable system in that if you're producing something that there is no demand for, the price, quote-unquote, of your uh, commodity, quote-unquote, not a commodity, your, uh, your thing, is going to go way down. And if you're producing something that there's just way too much of, again, y- there's going to be no point and you're not going to get many labor hours for your uh, y- your work or whatever. Like, there's y- the industry isn't going to be viable anymore. So it's like there, there are still incentive structures to be useful and to be, uh, uh, to look after needs. It's not like you can just do useless stuff and expect everyone to just be fine with it. Like, there is obviously an element of democratic control that's going to come around and be like, bro, what are you doing? Nobody wants these things. Mm-hmm. But then also, like, you're just not going to be able to do too much because it's just going to be like you have a useless industry. So it's interesting just thinking about all of the different, like, incentive structures that are built in to the singular idea of this one idea of uh, changing the economic laws of, of motion. Um without having to think of, like, the capitalist way of doing things, which is like, well, what about if we gave people uh, credits for for building electronic vehicles and they can trade these credits and shit like that? Like, it, it's way more simple than that. It's like, produce something useful and you'll be fine. Or, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. do yeah. something useful. Imagine being proposed the choice, like, <laughs> produce useful ends. Produce <laughs> to meet useful ends. Produce to meet needs or artificially create markets <laughs> because you have a fetish for markets uh, and, yeah, and, choo- and choosing the latter yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised <laughs> Rishi Sunak <laughs> not Rishi Sunak I don't mean Rishi Sunak what's he called um, maybe also Rishi Sunak yeah probably Rishi Sunak <laughs> I'm thinking of our new health minister anyway no clue yeah, who cares oh uh, is it the bald guy yeah yeah I don't care <laughs> who cares these people they're pigs um but yes, it, imagine a world, Dan, where people create things f- 
super needs Mm -hmm. for use and that Mm -hmm. being worthwhile instead of just the crap that we have now because yeah hey uh newsflash i get the feeling if you listen to this podcast you already know this but capitalism is not produced for needs produces for profit and uh yeah those are not not the same thing but again, mm-hmm. just the, this, you, you think of the viable systems model and you, system model and you think of Stafford Beer when they talk about the democratic control that is necessary to organize all of this stuff, the general council. But then you also think of it when they talk about how these economic laws fulfill themselves as it is just a viable system. It, it looks after itself without needing much poking and prodding and neoliberal fixing and, you know, tweaking things. Um, yeah, that's also another thing I got very excited about, that whole idea. Hmm. Uh, do you have any more to say on the idea of expansion? Because you've kind Ooh. of you've cr- kind of transitioned us very nicely into the idea of control, yeah. which is one of the other chapters. But also, we haven't really discussed what they propose for uh, expansion. Although their their proposal is quite, um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, that they, they propose deducting a certain portion from everybody's wages to go toward a general fund for expansion, and then mm. they, they they say ten percent, which seems like ludicrously <laughs> large to me, but whatever. Um, and you basically basically what they say is every industry will be given a maximum amount by which they're allowed to expand their production, mm. and that's already budgeted for in in the degree to which everybody is is already paying into that fund, which is decided by the, the basically yeah. just a, yeah basically like. We've already, you've already come across this before in terms of when we were talking about the general social work, right? But they add into their various formulas, various different ways to work out deductions that would be taken from wages to budget for uh, various types of social work. And there's a few that they propose in this, but like, yeah, that's the general gist of it, I suppose. Yeah, you could vary that. Yeah. And then there could be some trading, right? Some industry decides they don't need to expend by 10%, mm. given that the aim is to meet needs, right? Maybe the needs are already being met. Maybe they even want to scale back their production to some extent because they're already vastly expanding, uh, exceeding the demand, and they might pass on some of that expansion capacity to other industries, other places, kind of thing. Mm. Um, it's all stuff that's kind of glossed over in terms of the way they pr- propose it is that, like, the question of how you expand production, how you grow your economy, is not really an economic one for them. It's actually a political one, right? It's yeah. how the political apparatuses of the communist society are going to democratically decide uh the councils the the councils exactly yeah (laughs) yeah they use the phrase what is it the gen the general social council or whatever the general council whatever it is and then they never use it again it's like the what (laughs) 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 can we talk about that (laughs) Uh Uh yeah yeah that's all i got to say about that cool (laughs) um Um, shall we talk control dan yeah 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 well Uh, Well, I guess they, they once again use a discussion of control to criticize the Soviet Union, uh, to criticize this idea of top-down control, to criticize the idea of the controller standing outside of society. And what they're trying to p- propose instead, what they're trying to suggest is that the fundamental principles of communism that they're putting forward um, contains within it principles of control. Mm. It's similar to like... Berean cybernetics, I suppose, the system is self-regulating. And it's basically, from what I can understand, predicated on this idea of... um, Well, uh, various feedback loops. One is like um, the feedback loop that is consumption by people goes forward to influence the how production happens. But also like... um, the relationship between need and how that drives production. Um, but ge- it, more generally, it's the idea of just an open access to information. So like um, in terms of like the disciplining factor, I suppose, like by virtue of the fact that the labor time calculation is so clear and so open, you can very clearly see where there are problems in the productive process. Mm. Um, and the question of how to... The 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 the, no, the 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 answers to any irregularities that come up are probably quite easy and clear to see whether it's like there's something wrong in this productive uh, unit whereby they're requiring so many more labor hours to produce things and other and other things and how are we gonna mm. um, how whether it's to some extent it's left to the I suppose 
productive units, the example they use is shoe factories, I guess fall within a, a larger um, umbrella organization, which is like all of the shoe producers together get together and can kind of like uh, <laughs> discipline or uh, help or what have you, certain productive units kind of thing. Uh, but for me anyway, it's predicated on this sort of open access to very clear information, which is not obscured in the way that it is under capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting, right? Because like they say, say like I, they use the example of also like a textile factory is like, damn, we've realized that we can't meet uh, demand. We're, we're going to have to go tell everybody and put forward a plan that says, okay, we need to expand production by X percentage. Uh, here's what we need to do it. Can you please grant us the, you know, uh, the okay, the say-so to allow us to go forward and expand production, give us the proper like labor hours or whatever to do it, um, put that into the budget, and here's how we'll make that happen. But they also make the point that like once you once you accept that as part of the plan, like you accept the like these general rules of a communist society, like everybody has to follow this plan. And that was another thing that was also like um, implementing that when you talk about control is like tricky because they talk a little bit in this about like excluding firms that don't fall under this dream that are like we don't want to do this we're not going to do this goddamn commies we're never going to do this mm -hmm. nobody in florida would want to do this mm -hmm. um that comes down to like a whole other question of like okay well then how do you implement these general laws of uh e economic movement and how do you control things when you have people who don't want to do this um, and it's interesting because they basically fall back in the idea of like, well, what else are they going to do? And like, they're going to have to, like, they talk about agriculture, this whole chapter on agriculture, but they basically just say like, so the peasants don't want to sell to the commies. They're going to have to, because the commies are the ones in the cities and the commies are the one who buy things. So it's like this idea of control, they put a lot of faith in it being a viable system and it regulating itself. Um, but yeah, I, I, have, I have faith that it would be because it's like, that's kind of one and the same, the textile factory asking for more stuff versus like the people who don't want to do things. It's like the system will sort itself out, hopefully. Yeah, there is an extent to which like the question of power comes back into play here, yeah. whereby yeah. you have to have kind of implemented the system and have it be the dominant one. Mm. And then it's it's by virtue of its dominance, it would sort of wrinkle out. It yeah, would it even, even out the wrinkles rather. Yeah. Um, so there, yeah, there is a certain amount of like you have to get a, to get to a certain point of its impl implementation before mm. it becomes viable. Yeah, I doing suppose. that without a state, I think, is a big question mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but who knows? Yeah, there is a point. I'm just look, glancing down at my various notes, which now <laughs> um, take them out entirely out of context. <laughs> I don't know to what extent what they mean necessarily. <laughs> Uh, but there's a point in which the, in time where they talk about um, socially average production time being the controlling mechanism of communist society, mm. um, which I say in order to further elaborate what I was saying before in terms of like, um, it's the calculation in labor time. It's the basic principles of their communist society, which also allow for its control, you know. So that's speaking again to the idea of like control and regulation being internal to the system rather than being something imposed from yeah. without. The same as like um, what they talk about in terms of the the sort of general social plan for production kind of thing being again mm -hmm. something that's not like determined by the central planning office and that just tells everybody how much of everything they're going to produce yeah. but rather it's this relationship between like um production be it well the reproduction of society being influenced by um how it already produces kind of thing and how it's failing to meet demand or not meet or succeeding in meeting demand mm. being the the thing which regulates i suppose like mm. it's things internal to the system that they're proposing that are intended to regulate the system. Whether you think it succeeds in that end, I'm not sure. But <laughs> yeah. um, tell us what you think, folks. I don't know. Yeah, Will this succeed? I, <laughs> I mean, I think you've described Dan perfectly. Mm. 
to the point I'm not even going to bring it up, <laughs> the dictatorship of the proletariat mm. in their eyes, right? Because I think a lot of us think of the dictatorship of the proletariat as like a literal dictatorship where the proletariat is like lining up the Jeff Bezos against a wall and yeah. shooting the Jeff I'm not Bezos. saying it's not. Yeah, that. well, by all means, <laughs> perhaps. We're not saying line them up against walls. Just put the vibes out there. Yeah, vibes, yeah, yeah. Is a, that's a proven, <laughs> that works, guys. Vibes work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, the dictatorship of the proletariat uh, under our council, communist friends' eyes, is literally just implementing this economic law. And there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah, it the, sort itself out. Yeah, yeah. The most interesting um, element in that chapter is when they're talking about the way in which uh, the disciplining element of the economic system in which they're proposing and the way in which the dictatorship of the proletariat would discipline people who were unwilling to operate under that system. Mm. It's basically by cutting them off from all access to economic life. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. okay, so you're the workers in an economic unit and you want to go at your go at your own way. You mm. want to have full disposal of the things that you produce. You're unwilling to have those things that you produce be part of the general stock of society. You're not willing to collectivize the ownership. Mm. Okay, well, we're just <laughs> going to cut you off from all of the produ yeah. productive units. If you're unwilling to operate <laughs> with labor time as your unit of accounting, mm. well, there's no way in which you can um, trade in air quotes, scare quotes, with other productive units. There's no way you can yeah. get the variable God. <laughs> 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 I'm say variable capital. There's no just way you can it. get the inputs to your production <laughs> Yeah, uh, and there's necessary. no way even that you could like dispose of the products of what you the things that you produce other than for your own consumption you if you are cut off thing. from communist economic life, which is yeah. basically what they're proposing. Um, the dictatorship of the proletariat would be. They do say some other things in terms of like dictatorship. Yes, in its commonly understood sense, mm. in a, a period of transition, right? Like there might be a degree to which there's a requirement to, in terms of like. In, in comparison to the kind of like pluralistic democracy of liberal capitalism, mm. there might be a degree to which uh, certain class actors are... Uh, Put out. Di <laughs> oh, dis Oops. Disendowed of political rights, I was about to say. Or like... Yeah. Only to the extent that like it was necessary to... Um, facilitate the transition, facilitate the abolition of class... Um, but they also make the point that communist society is one of represented by freedom and equality and the degree of democ democracy that's represented by the system of control that they're proposing, mm. um, the degree of autonomy that's given to the people who are working in any productive unit and the degree of democratic control that comes from by virtue of being a consumer um, – represent to them a sort of like a cultural ascendancy of mm. human social life to a much higher freer more democratic plane of existence kind of thing yeah. so there is this this tension between like um the political requirement to repress a class mm. and the um Liberatory, liberatory and democratic aspects of the political system that that class would want, or the, the, the proletarian class is going to mm. put into place kind of thing. Yeah, well, break out the goddamn Ellen Meekson's wood bell because, like, that reminds, I think, us of nothing other than the theory of capitalism, the transition to capitalism that she puts forward. It was like, okay, you don't want to, you still want to do it how we did under feudalism? You still want to live outside of these developing historical economic laws, good for you. That's not going to work out. Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. Everyone else who didn't want to do capitalism, yeah. who didn't want to sell their labor, mm, didn't work out too well for them. They had to. They were forced to. So you see, yeah. Yeah, you see some mirror forms there. It's a really excellent analogy, which I hadn't really thought about in terms of the way like the transition to organizing economic life that came about by the adoption of the market as a disciplining mm. mechanism that basically just like forced agriculture producers in um, England to operate under new economic norms that was representative of a change in social relations. Um, 
this book is representing or offering a different change in uh, the introduction of a new disciplining mechanism mm. that's analogous to how the market functioned in the origins of capitalism. You're going to have a new disciplining function that's going to facilitate a transition here, which is, um, in air quotes, going to force the transition, I suppose. Yeah, and instead of having hordes of you know famished peasants wandering around the countryside looking for work hopefully you'll just have a couple of jeff b's i put out uh, <laughs> and they'll just be wandering around with a cup shaking full of coins um yeah not great yeah, yeah, yeah. i mean that wasn't great this will yeah, be great yeah, yeah, yeah. um well, what we'll do is we'll develop like the one man distribution center where the only worker is Jeff Bezos. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He can be the man just pressing the button that turns the robots on and off. And we and get then. his labor hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, just to, to sum that up too, I really like this quote at the end of chapter 16. Where they say, It is therefore a dictatorship, this is about the dictatorship of the proletariat, it is therefore a dictatorship which dies of its own accord as soon as the whole of social life is placed on the new foundations of the abolition of wage labor. It is also a dictatorship which is not carried out by the bayonet, but by the economic laws of the movement of communism. It is not the state that carries out the economic dictatorship, but something much more powerful than the state, the laws of economic movement. They say it's not carried out by the bayonet, but also at the beginning of the chapter, they're like, it's going to be bloody. Like, come on, it's, it's going to have to be. Um, but yeah, I mean, very much wisdom in that. And again, you just see the mirror form of capitalism and that it's like, how do we get into this mess? Well, we're going to get out of it in a similar way. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I mean, I think we're going to have to. It's frustrating how much economics plays a role in our lives. I mean, duh, it does. Surprise, surprise, the mode of production determines a lot of stuff in your life, but also like, God damn it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hate that. Um, yeah. Anything else to say on the DOP? Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. The, the whole bit on agriculture, I didn't know how much to actually take from just because it's like, how much has agriculture actually changed since the 1930s, 1920s when this was written? I have literally no idea. So I couldn't get much from it. Yeah. They're proposing that agriculture hasn't like scaled in the way that other forms of production have scaled and by which I mean, like in size, in there's lots of smaller units of agricultural production compared to the shrinking number of industrial units of production, if that yeah. makes any sense. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, so what they, what they suggest is that's disadvantageous in terms of political organizing in the sense that you don't have um, uh, the sort of basis for... Uh, proletarian organizing isn't quite there because there aren't as many proletarians and they're not organized in big uh, industrial units where they can uh, operate and organize effectively kind of thing. Mm. But they're also implying that the same laws of capitalism affect the, the way that agricultural capitalists and agricultural producers are required to produce. Mm. So they have a similar incentive, perhaps, to want to get on board with the transition away from capitalism. Mm. And they're also suggesting that whereas for the Soviet Union or for the, for, the, for the Russian Communist Party, there was a real issue with agricultural production because the transition they wanted to make was by... was The transition to communism they wanted to implement was one where industries are nationalized mm. you really want like really large-scale industries to yeah. nationalize them it's much easier to then uh include them in your economic planning whereby obviously for their system it really doesn't matter how big every economic unit is they just offer they're just suggesting how economic units are going to organize themselves and relate to one another but you can have infinitely many economic units if you wanted to i mean you could have as many economic units as you had individuals i suppose although mm. it wouldn't function particularly well um so i guess yeah what they're saying is that like uh their system both recognizes why um people who work in agricultural industries would both be interested in a transition and also how that the, they would be it would be possible to successfully include them in the trend of transition they're proposing in a way that it wasn't possible for the soviets to include them in the way that they're transition mm. was happening but yeah. as you say like 
we're talking 100 years on from when <laughs> yeah, or whatever, exactly. 80 years on from when this book was written, yeah. how much of what they're saying about agriculture actually applies anymore. Yeah, I wonder, like, if you go to, like, the breadbasket of America, like, how many of those farms are actually owned by larger conglomerates and et cetera. Yeah. Like, I know in meat production, it's a lot easier to just, like, have a monopoly and, like, like there's... This is by any, no means monopoly, but in California, when you drive along the five, you come across a place called Harris Ranch, and it's just like, it, there's like a neat hotel, and it's fun to go to, but then like you get to the land that they own, because they specialize in fucking like steak and cows and shit like that, and it, for miles, it's just cows stacked on top of each other. So perhaps now it's been easier to create a monopoly on meat production and stuff like that, like Dyson. I know like whenever you buy any kind of chicken in America, like it is probably Dyson. I think it's Dyson. Or is that the vacuum company? It's something like Dyson. Like there are yeah, just that like, sounds about, there is, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, there Dyson are like foods, is yeah. Tyson? Tyson, Tyson foods. Yeah, yeah Tyson. <laughs> Tyson. <laughs> but yeah, that is the vacuum. <laughs> I, 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 I question this by virtue of my own uh having no idea whether this is true still or not. I would imagine it's not as true anymore. But again, kind of doesn't really matter um, unless you're kind of on the ground level because the same laws of economic movement will still apply if it's, you know, Joe Schmo working a farm, or like some PB prick or like, you know, Tyson, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there is always the question of like the number of people who work in these industries has yeah. just reduced and reduced and reduced. Yeah, absolutely, not. yeah. Yeah. Um, we need to no, no. organize Plus the, the like uh, well, you, you talk about like like lots and lots and lots full filled with cows for mm. miles and miles and miles and I'm just like my brain's like metabolic rift. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no kidding. No kidding. So I don't know. The work that would have to be done in rejigging our food production system. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a whole other question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that, that also gets into when you like s- smartly organize how people live and you have all of this land and you want to do things correctly and you're able to see what harm our current system does too. Let's just say you're an asshole who eats a lot of meat. Like, if you were to see what <laughs> harm is... <laughs> sorry. <laughs> not supposed to potentially insult the listeners, though. <laughs> I'm not you do intend to insult the listeners, it's supposed to be an in joke <laughs> that's already established. It's yeah, no. Joke. Let's say you're a normal guy who eats a lot of meat. Um, <laughs> if you were to see the like harm that's coming to you from the current system of you eating meat, like you would want to eat in a more sustainable way. And I'm not saying that as some like hippy dippy like don't hurt the cows, don't hurt the cows, but also like you you would want better food and you would want it to be far more sustainably. So the reason I bring up like housing and stuff like that is because it's like, oh wow, we have all of this land. Would you perhaps want to be involved in food production? Would you want to re-regionalize it? Now that we see all of the waste that goes into the example I bring up a million times of like growing cows or raising cows in Argentina, shipping the meat to China to be packaged, then to New York to be eaten. Mm -hmm. You'd go, wow, this makes no sense. Look at all the waste that's going into this for our labor hours and this plan. Like, let's do it more regionally. Perhaps not as shitty as we do it now. Yeah. So. It goes without saying what I'm going to say it anyway. Like, <laughs> um, what Jack's just described is representative of how capitalism is organized to facilitate profits for yeah. a capitalist class, and how communism would seek to meet need. Yeah, and that system would be that that food system would be another example of a productive industry that we might want to rejig to yeah. a larger or greater, lesser or greater extent, probably greater in that instance, mm. to meet needs better than it currently does. Mm. Yeah. yeah, and also, like, yeah, we almost made it through an episode talking about this book without ragging on anarchists, but, like, if you want to organize a society in which you're able to get, like, coffee and stuff, like, it would be so dope if that could just be organized on, like, mutual agreement, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, but, like, these laws of economic movement make it so that it's, like, oh, you, there are incentive structures in place to, like, distribute coffee all around the world. So Because I bring up coffee because that's something that can only be grown in a specific part of the world. Um, so, yeah, we love mm-hmm. coffee. Mm-hmm. Dan mm-hmm. hassles me because I only drink instant coffee, but, you know, what are you going to do? I've never hassled I drink <laughs> instant coffee. I drink instant coffee with my garbanzo beans. But I'm going to from now on. <laughs> <laughs> um... Yeah, you've brought us full circle in terms of like yeah. you brought us back to centralize and centralism and federalism and yeah, like, um, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, it is funny because it's like that must have been the big question going on at that at their time. Obviously, when the Soviet Union was a thing and the Soviet Union was still trying to figure out what it was going to do, what it was going to be, we're going to centralize everything like that. We we're just going to be like, whoa, dude. We're done, <laughs> it was in its like teenage identity <laughs> yeah, crisis yeah, stage. Exactly. Um, <laughs> But it's like, I, when they framed this whole book with that question, I was like, I, uh, is that the question I have? But then it's like, yeah, I guess so. It's a different way of phrasing the question of like, state socialism maybe, or like anarchism, dude. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. 
And it is yeah. a useful Yeah, well, it's good because it's like federated in the sense of those ultimate uh, decision-making power rests with uh, devolved and federated agencies in terms of like each individual productive unit, but also it's centralized because it's mm. governed by one economic principle and law i suppose mm. and you have to adhere to the new economic laws of communism if you want to operate in the communist economy mm. so there is a, a a heavily centralized aspect to an otherwise democratically devolved system yeah yeah absolutely just because whenever we do a book, I like to read the last <laughs> sentence. They say the contrast between centralism and federalism is abolished in a higher entity. The organism of production has become an organic unity. That's pretty bold. It's a bit trippy at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's like, whoa, Ooh. dude. Whoa, mm -hmm. Stafford Beer. Mm -hmm. um, Can I say something? Oh, please. This book rocks. Yeah, it does rock. <laughs> this book is fucking awesome. It's so good. And you were you were absolutely right to get us to read Critique of the Gotham Program in between this because it was just like, holy shit, this, like, uh, people who have pictures of Marx on their walls and people who have pictures of Lenin on their walls, it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> really cool to do that. That's so communist of you. But also, like, it's almost frustrating because it's like, this is what Marx said. And it is right. It's like, it's almost like if you dedicate your life to understanding the pitfalls of capitalism and why they happen, you'll be able to kind of, like, uh, realize how things could be better. And that it isn't just this radical overhauling of like, fuck it, let's just not do anything, dude. Let's just be anarchists, whatever. Like, a, I should say a caricature of an anarchist. It is like pretty similar and it rocks. Mm -hmm. And like, I think if there's one thing that I've gotten away from this book, it's like, we all need to be doing everything we can, I think, to like spread the idea of labor time planning. Because it's the classic refrain of the chud to just say like, well, what else are you going to do? Say what you will about <laughs> capitalism, it distributes stuff, which like it does horribly unequally. And like the majority of the world suffers on account of that. But like, you do need to have something positive to tie it back to all of our other councilist friends. You need to have something to add and something to create. And this is it. It's labor time yeah. planning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought of a Simpsons analogy. <laughs> <laughs> And I don't know how well it works, except for the fact that it's the Simpsons. I'm just going to say right, it. Yeah, let's hear it. Enjoy. <laughs> Thinking about uh, the Soviet models of the transition to communism being Bart Simpson trying to skateboard across the whatever that chasm is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, classic. Yeah. The gorge. Anyway, yeah. yeah. You can't skateboard across the court, the gorge to communism. <laughs> it's going to have to be some uh, more manageable steps. Yeah, you'll wind up like Homer. Yeah. I, I saw that episode when I was a like, little kid, and it's so disturbing when yeah, Homer yeah, falls down the cliff. Multiple times. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> um, there's an episode, a relatively recent episode, where it's a trace of terror where Homer, or not Homer, Sideshow Bob successfully kills Bart and then realizes that he has no meaning in his life anymore because that was the point of his life. <laughs> so he invents a machine to kill him again and again. And it's just like, stop, you're ruining my childhood. It's like, my God. Uh, uh, horrific, horrific. Well, Dan, this book rocks. We did uh -huh. it. We read the third book of the show. Oh, it's more than that. The fourth book. Fourth? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, I don't know. I thought we counted once and it was yeah, We did. Than... Ellen Meekson's Wood. Uh, Miliband. Miliband. Cybernetic Revolutionaries. Yeah. This? Is that it? It'll soon be the CIA book. Maybe we'll have read the CIA book at soon, some point yeah. in time. That we, yeah, we'll need to uh, prepare ourselves for that. Read this book, everybody. And yeah, again, you got you to gotta remember that capitalism or socialism isn't just not doing capitalism. It's something positive. I think that was Paul Maddock that said that. It's, it's some, it has to be, you have to have a project because literally no one will listen to you and they shouldn't listen to you if you don't have an idea for how things are going to be. If you're just some prick being like, things suck, we should change it. And they're like, how should you change it? And like, I don't know. It's like, no one should listen to you at all. So come up with an mm -hmm. idea. Maybe come up with it through reading this book and spread it because this is really good stuff. And everyone will benefit from it except for like seven guys, but who gives a fuck about them? Yeah. <laughs> bees eye. Bees-eye. bees, -eye. bees -eye. The Goddamn bees eye. <laughs> Um, all right, yeah. all right, yeah. The new Kill Team trailer rocks. Cool, it really rocks. Cool, cool, cool. Maybe what? Me? Yeah. Just thinking about. I was wondering how much that box is going to be. I know they haven't said how much it's going to be. It's yeah. going to. It's going to be expensive. It's going to yeah. be fucking expensive. Um, that'd be cool. I do. Yeah, I do like the. Um, what are they? The Deathcore Creek models. Oh, yeah, they're, they're cool. They're I'm really cool. It. I like I'm the idea it. too of of just like singular unit activations of like they do that in Warcry, which is like the Age of Sigmar. 
uh, skirmish thing. But like, I like the idea of like activating one model and then you take a turn. The other person activates one model as opposed to everything. All okay. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, anyway, this is a <laughs> go <niche>. watch it. <laughs> our, our brave uh, Krieg core death guys defeating the orcs. Actually, I'm on team orcs. They're much cooler. Yeah. Oh, okay, almost an hour and a half. So we should probably end we it. We should probably start. Um, <laughs> we'll see you next time, everybody. I don't know what we're doing next time. Um, we'll see. Yeah. Good time. Thanks for listening. Good fun. See you next time. The music you heard this episode was Music to Kill Bad People To by King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. If you like this song, you can check it out and much, much more on their Bandcamp at kinggizzard.bandcamp.com. Be sure and follow us up on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, be sure and tune in next week for some more commie discussion. Till next time. Whoa.